Off the west coast of Vancouver Island, British Columbia, the land meets the Pacific Ocean in a confluence of natural beauty and history. For thousands of years, First Nations inhabitants were sustained by the fruitful productivity of Barclay Sound. first Europeans arrived. And for a while the bounties of land and sea sustained them as well. As with other communities along the coast, Bamfield thrived. At first glance, Barclay Sound still appears unchanged. But after years of exploitation, the marine landscape has been altered. Some things are disappearing. A lowly mollusk, the abalone, once an important part of the ecosystem and a valuable resource for a vanishing culture, is now hard to find. I mean, it would be wonderful to see a thriving abalone population again. And I think everybody together wants to see the abalone come back. There, there were a lot of abalone on the, on, you know, out in the water, and you had to wait till about the lowest tide of the year to ever get down to, to get the duck. For the last two years we put anything on, we couldn't even get any mabalone because there was nothing left. They were all gone. I've never tried an abalone and my mom, she used to talk about them all the time and, and that they can't have them anymore. And, but everyone that I've talked to they, that have tried abalone, they just love them. So it'd be really nice to be able to eat some of my traditional food again. <laughs> The people who live in and around Bamfield have a deep affection for their community. But like in other small coastal communities, making a living is becoming more difficult. The, the, the atmosphere has changed. Bamfield is growing smaller. The, uh, <clears throat> the marine industry has been dying, so there's uh, hardly any commercial fishing that happens now. Bamfield has become a tourist community. Abalone fisheries began, much as with most other subtidal or deep water invertebrate fisheries, um, in the 1960s. And people started using scuba gear to actually um, harvest abalone. Jane Watson is a coastal ecologist. The harvest rate was very, very intense. And in 1990, that fishery was shut down because, um, as far as could be made out, abalone populations have been over harvested and could no longer support a fishery. Um, the abalone was subsequently declared as a threatened species. Recently, however, the threatened abalone has been offered new hope from the Bamfield Huayat Community Abalone Project, known as BCAP. It's a community effort to raise abalone in a new hatchery overseen by scientists and with the hope, ultimately, of placing the hatched abalone back in the ocean. The Bamfield Ruhayat Community Abalone Project is a, is a unique project in that it's, it's a, a stewardship project that's been tackled at the community level. Yeah, so I've got a whole crew coming down tomorrow to pull all the plastic up. So the recovery of abalone, getting abalone off the threatened species list, um, is, is the primary goal. Oh, see, one of them is alive. One of them is alive. Don Renfrew is, is chief next? biologist the for BCAP. Right side up. The BCAP is, I think, a very powerful partnership between three rather different groups, the Banfield Community School Association, the Hawaii First Nation, and the Banfield Marine Sciences Center. What makes it powerful and unique 
is the way it plays to the strengths of the partners, who have at times been motivated by conflicting interests. The First Nations, with its historical stewardship approach to nature, and the power of Western science to understand how complex ecosystems actually work and can be managed. Together, they are attempting to confront a common threat. Tom Happinook is the hereditary whaling chief of the Huwayat First Nations. And what I would like to see is a union of these three elements. Uh, where we have Western science participating in a management scheme along with traditional ecological knowledge and these modern-day management techniques that have been developed. How to get there is precisely the question BCAP addresses. Is it possible to partner First Nations wisdom with Western science? Robert Dennis is the elected chief of the Huwayat First Nations. The Huwayat people have been living in and around the Banfield area uh, for thousands of years, actually. Uh, we just recently uh, confirmed uh, through an archaeological site, uh, for example, that the Tekihkin village is over 5,000 years old. The, the main source of food for, for the human feces there at the time was marine resources. This is our identity, this is our land, this is where we've been for thousands of years. So we're, we're here to stay. Yeah. The Huayat uh, and indeed the Nuchano uh, people have a principle uh, that guides our decision making. Uh, in our language, Hishuk Zawak. Everything is one, everything is connected. And uh, when we made decisions based on Hishuk Zawak, everything is one, everything is connected. It ensured that the natural resources that we were utilizing on a sustainable basis were going to be there for future generations. My grandpa used to describe um, when we would go for a walk in the woods, and he would say to me, take a step, so I'd take a step, and then he'd say, okay, take another step, and I'd take another step, and then he'd have me look at my footprint, and he says, I want you to imagine now where, what that footprint has touched, and well, you can see there's a tree there, so you've stepped on a root, you've stepped on the branch here, that goes up there, and how it all, and he just sort of walked through how that one footprint had touched so many things as they were connected. And, uh, and I, thank, I thank the Creator for that, because he taught me a lot of things. The traditional use of abalone was, was very similar to other, other uh, shellfish, that it, it was uh, uh, harvested and, and taken for consumption and, and as a delicacy. And then, uh, of course, using it in, in our making of masks. You know, uh, when you want to make a mask shine and glitter, like if, if you were making an eye on a mask, and then the eye would be the, the shell of an abalone. But if the abalone disappears, so do the glittering masks. Traditional foods, a receding memory. And all because we've ignored an important value in traditional culture, the notion of all life being connected. Obviously, uh, we weren't being heard. Because if we were being heard, and we were able to bring forward those philosophies that guided our resource management uh, decisions, then things, I think, uh, would be very different, very different today. But today, it's difficult to find abalone. More and more, these divers working for BCAP come up empty-handed. My involvement at BCAP is actually with the, the diving side of things. So that started off with doing the collections. My other side of what I've been involved with has been the subtidal monitoring. So actually going out and doing a small scale intensive abalone survey. To find out the environmental conditions that are suitable for supporting abalone and what their environmental preferences are. So that when we get to outplanting, they will be outplanting them in places where they have the greatest chance of success. New scientific discoveries are being combined with old-fashioned know-how in the construction of the abalone hatchery, and it is on its way.
The development and construction of the BCAP hatchery marks a changing time for the people of Bamfield. The Abalone Project greatly benefits from its home, the Bamfield Marine Sciences Center, where there's access to many research opportunities. Little is known about the abalone and how to culture them. Many questions must be answered to ensure their survival. There, there is some knowledge on, on how to how to raise abalone in a hatchery. It's done in other countries in the world, but it isn't done in Canada, and it isn't done with the species that we have here. With other shellfish species, it's a different but complementary story. Bob Milne runs an oyster farm in a very environmentally sensitive way. He takes this so seriously that doing it right is as important as making money, something he feels all aquaculture should do. I think it can be done in a responsible manner so that everybody wins and actually the shellfish aquaculture can actually add more to an area and have it more biologically diverse than it originally was without any great cost. What I'd really like to see is them practicing aquaculture right in Bamfield Inlet System and not so much for for-profit reasons but as a symbolic thing that, that we can cooperate to a point where we can do shellfish aquaculture and have people living all along the shores as well. I mean, wouldn't that be wonderful? BCAP currently helps to employ several people from the community with hopes to add many more in the future. In the future, it's hoped that BCAP will be self-sustaining, producing abalone for sale, which will fund more research and enhancement. Both business and research spin-offs are important community-building components. Louis Drewell is a longtime Banfield resident who runs a small-scale, sustainable kelp farm in Barclay Sound. Oh, hi, I'm at the office. Uh... <laughs> My wife and I have a, what you might call a cottage industry, and it's called Canadian Kelp Resources. And we uh, make sea vegetables from farmed and wild kelp. Working with seaweeds and working with abalone, there are a lot of common denominators. First of all, abalone eats seaweed. And so I do work with the, the Abalone Project, uh, trying to discover new ways to uh, fatten up these animals in a, in a natural way in contrast to pelletized foods and such as that. So far, attempts to save the abalone have not succeeded, and it's a mystery. Since 1990, there's been a complete ban on harvesting. No other commercial fishery has been shut down this way, and yet, stocks continue to decline. There is a market demand for abalone, and right now, because you can't legally go and fish them, um, that market demand is, is being filled by poached abalone. Humans often assume that as predators, when we exploit a resource, we do the same as the natural predator. And in actual fact, that's not true at all. A human fishery when it goes to an extractive resource, as that resource becomes rarer and rarer, the resource becomes more valuable. A wild predator, such as an otter on the other hand, as a resource becomes more rare, is less likely to harvest it. In Vancouver's Chinatown, legal abalone are for sale in jars by the dozens. These dried abalone sell for up to $1,000 a pound. Um, this is come from uh, different countries. For example, this kind is come from Japan, and it's a, it's a very good quality of the abalone. Although this is a legal market supplied with abalone from legitimate international sources, there is also a demand for black market poached abalone. Abalone poachers have been convicted in numerous coastal communities. At one time, poached abalone were worth $40 to $50 a pound on the black market. To reduce the amount of abalone poaching in the Barclay Sound area, BCAP and the Bamfield Marine Sciences Centre have started a program called Coast Watch. The uh, Abalone Coast Watch program in Bamfield is um is a program that's been put into place to prevent poaching. And it's also really good for raising awareness in the sound um, beyond our community, um, knowing that there are people out there on the water who are keeping their eyes open, not just fisheries officers, but um, it could be anyone in a boat going by who's, who's part of the Coast Watch program. So 
poaching prevention is a big part of Coast Watch. But it takes awareness to know what to watch for. Community and public education is a large part of the abalone project, made possible by the partnership with the Bamfield Marine Sciences Center. Okay, so when you think about abalone, overconsumption is going to be a big problem. The, the public education program is really important in um, abalone recovery. Uh, our, our program impacts students from all over Western Canada. When we first started the educational component of the Babylonian Recovery Plan, um, we went into the schools and when we asked, who knows what an abalone is? No, none of the kids knew, well actually one little boy knew that it was an ashtray with holes in it. But that was about the extent of their knowledge about abalone. And the, the children and the young people have totally come on board since then. A little thing like an abalone can make a big change to everything. Students visiting the Bamfield Marine Sciences Center are thoroughly immersed in abalone and conservation education. They're able to experience firsthand the natural power of Barkley Sound. With advanced technology, students are brought into the underwater world of the abalone for an unforgettable experience. In the community of Bamfield, there are mixed feelings about the importance of BCAP. By nature, it's a great project, but I'm a little, just a little confused as to whether it's really an aquaculture project, an enhancement project, a community project, or a First Nations project. And I know it's all of those, but the, cha the actual chances of these projects leading to everybody's desired end goal and having a thriving abalone population in there and a, a profitable abalone farm employing all the locals, it, it, it seems a little pie in the sky to me at this point. I don't want to discount its efforts, but I would really like, love to have to eat my words in the end. And it, it just seems like the odds are stacked against the abalone's success. There are indeed many challenges to be met if a commercially viable and environmentally sensitive abalone fishery is to be re-established and enhanced. But it is worth the effort. And the union of science, First Nations traditional knowledge, and community cooperation is itself an inspiring paradigm. The work that we're doing on the restoration of, uh, of our natural resources is the driving force to this cultural revival and the rebirth of our nation. The rebirth of the Huayat First Nation, much like the phoenix bird, where it's arising out of the ashes. In part, it, it's, a, it's a, a statement on our ability to live with the other things in the environment. If we allow overfishing and poaching, or have allowed those things to happen in the past, we're, we really haven't been very good um, managers. Um, or we've interfered too much with the natural environment. My grandmother uh, is a world-renowned basket weaver because what she does is she takes basket weaving and she covers this abalone shell uh, with made of basketry and it is just beautiful. So when I'm able to bring her a nice abalone shell from, you know, our traditional territory, it's going to be a fabulous day, a fabulous day. I'm overwhelmed uh, the, that, that it, it, it's a project uh, shared by the Banfield community working together. So the Abalone project is, is helping bring stewardship back to the community. Uh, that means now that, that I'm beginning to see that, that 
there are people who want to share the same goal we have, and that in that way, I, I'm I'm just so proud that 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 our our small community may become a leader in in BC and a leader in Canada. We always try and promote the principle of Hishuk Zawat because we think that this accumulated ancient wisdom uh, can transcend throughout uh, the globe, throughout, throughout life, um, and for all people, and, and, and in all areas. If we were able to fully understand uh, the impacts that this activity is having on this particular species, and, or, or so on and so forth, if we could get there, uh, I think that uh, we would be much better managers of the, of the resource. And if we can um, extrapolate uh, that principle over and around the globe, then I think uh, the world is going to be a better place uh, and, our, and our future generations uh, will indeed have, a, have natural resources to help sustain them uh, and their children into the future. It's going to be a fabulous day, a fabulous day.